Hello and welcome to the Birch Solar Project OPSB Public Information Meeting. My name is Chanel Montana and I would like to introduce you to some of the members of our team. I am the project lead and I am from LightSource BP. This presentation is put together with the help of Kevin Smith, our CEO, Alyssa Edwards, our Vice President of Environmental Affairs, Stephen Barnes, Vice President of Construction and Project Management, Courtney Doherty, who is a consultant for us at Stantec, Christine Pyrrhic, our counsel at Dickinson and Wright, Lexi Hain, our consultant, a consultant at Agrovaic Solutions, and Lewis Fox, our consultant at Agrovaic Solutions. In addition, we have Matthew Butler on the webinar, who is the Public Information Officer for the OPSB, or the Ohio Power Siting Board. Hi, my name is Kevin Smith. I'm CEO of the Americas for LightSource BP. Uh, I appreciate everybody joining us to learn a bit about uh, LightSource BP and uh, to learn uh, more about the, the Birch Solar Project. Uh, I'll give you a, the 30 seconds on my background. I'm a, a degreed mechanical engineer. I graduated from Purdue University in mechanical engineering um, and then uh, received a, a master's in, in finance, an MBA in finance from University of Chicago. Uh, and have spent my entire career in the, in the energy industry, um, kind of the first half of my career in conventional energy, uh, nuclear, natural gas primarily, uh, and then moved into renewable energy in 2004 and, and have been um, in the renewable energy industry ever since then. So um, long history uh, on all kinds of energy projects uh, throughout um, uh, the U.S. And, and worldwide as well. A bit about LightSource BP, uh, we're a global solar energy company. All we do is solar, large scale solar projects. Um, we have uh, um, 2.6 gigawatts, which is upwards to $3 billion worth of projects in operation uh, that we have ownership positions and, and manage the operations of those facilities. We've done almost $7 billion in financings around the world. Um, we're active in 13 countries and a, and a, and a worldwide staff of around 500. Um, a number of years ago, back in 2017, um, BP was expanding their, uh, looking to diversify their activities in energy. They initially took a minority position in LightSource. The company was rebranded LightSource BP. And then at the end of 2019, uh, BP uh, increased their ownership position to 50%. And so now the company is 50% owned by BP and 50% owned by, uh, by management. Uh, and BP is really looking, uh, as they move forward, looking to uh, diversify their activities and become really more of, a, of an integrated energy company active in across the, a diverse portfolio of different types of energy, including substantial ramp up of their renewable energy activities. Um, on the right side of the slide, a little bit on the, uh, our activities in the U.S. As I mentioned, I head up our U.S. activities. Um, we're active in 20 different states uh, and um, have a large portfolio of projects. Um, that 8 gigawatts is 8,000 megawatts of projects in various stages of development is, is 7 to $8 billion in potential investments that we're looking at over the, over the next kind of three to five years um, in the U.S. Um, uh, we've got uh, about 1,700 megawatts of projects under contract with utilities, corporate off-takers, municipal utilities, and co-ops, um, and, and almost 1,000 megawatts currently under construction, um, which would, is almost a billion dollars in projects. Um, we're, we're in the U.S., we're, we're considered probably now a medium-sized solar energy company. Certainly, there are bigger companies than us in the U.S., but we're, we're fa growing fast and, and accelerating uh, as we move into various projects uh, around the U.S. Our, our U.S. team is about 70 people, um, corporate offices in San Francisco, and uh, we have offices in Denver, uh, Philadelphia, um, small office in Atlanta, uh, and then uh, staffing in, in Arizona and Texas and a number of other uh, states around uh, around the the U.S. Um, you can see on that map where we're, we're active, um, not that active in the far west. Uh, a lot of those markets have been dominated by some of the bigger players that were active 
there, you know, years ago. And so when we moved into the markets, uh, into the solar markets in the U.S., we were looking at some of the newer markets. Um, so we're kind of, you know, Colorado, Texas, and and East. So you can see a fair amount of activity in the in the Midwest, um, you know, including you know Iowa, uh, Indiana, Ohio, uh, Pennsylvania, um, the Southeast, and and the Northeast. And so in the Southeast, you know, we've we've executed uh, contracts to build projects in some markets that you might might not think are natural solar markets like Alabama and Arkansas. Both those markets we have projects that will go into construction in, in 2021. And I'll move on to the next slide. Uh, this sl slide has some of the similar information from the, from, from the first slide. It talks about our, our uh, 1,700 megawatts of, of power contract, which is, which is almost $2 billion in investment opportunities that we expect to execute over the next 18 months, build those projects over the next 18 months. Um, large pipeline of projects across the U.S. and, and almost 1,000 megawatts uh, in uh, in commercial operation or construction since 2019. Um, uh, a few examples of some projects on the right side of the slide. Um, the the uh, a 70 megawatt facility in Pennsylvania uh, provides 25% uh, uh, of the electricity supply to Penn State University for their kind of 100,000 students across across the state. Um, we've got a 260 megawatt project. Um, uh, just coming into full commercial operation at the end of this year. It's partially in commercial operation now, um, large project in Texas. And then we just started construction on a 300 megawatt project in, uh, in Pueblo, Colorado. Um, we also have a small, a small project uh, in California. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a, you know, very uh, active portfolio of projects that we're developing. I'll go somewhat into the the you know why solar uh, and and why does why is it becoming so popular across the U.S. and really across the world? Um, number one issue is low cost. Um, it's now with in, improvements in technology and and massive reductions in manufacturing costs and the cost to to build solar projects. Um, it's now one of the cheapest forms of energy worldwide. Um, and, and in most of the states in the US, it's the cheapest form of energy. And many countries around the world, uh, it's, it's fastly becoming the, the cheapest form of energy. Um, pricing has declined, you know, 70% you know, or more over the last decade. Um, so as, as I said, it's, it's very competitive against natural gas, which is the, was previously the lowest cost power supply. And, and much, much cheaper than, uh, say, coal or, or nuclear power. Um, so that's the kind of the main reason now why, why people are looking at building solar. Obviously, there's, a, there's a, a, you know, concerns about climate change um, and a number of companies, utilities, and corporates are looking to reduce their carbon footprint. But in reality, the big, the big push um, for solar has become the, the low cost. It's, it's also reliable. A source of power. Um, it can be. Uh, it's generated and can be consumed in the in the in the networks around where that uh, energy is generated, um, and it provides uh, a, a nice diversification uh, from fossil fuels, um, which can have volatile pricing based on uh, uh, activities that happen in worldwide markets. Um, we can provide our our electricity very very cost competitively, and it can be. Uh, flat pricing for for 20 20 plus years so there's no escalation on fuels so we can provide nice reliable and uh and uh low price power um it also provides energy independence energy independence um so it you know as i mentioned insulates uh insulates the the buyer from volatility on on fossil fuel markets uh and uh and can provide that kind of homegrown electricity um, and then there's economic development activity. So in the areas where we, we build projects, there's, there's job creation, uh, there's diversification of the economies, uh, there's substantial uh, tax benefits. We'll talk about the tax benefits of the Birch Solar Project here. Um, and then we have operation, operating budgets that continue um, for decades uh, that continue to, to provide uh, funding into the community, uh, revenue into the community that's, that's, that's utilized uh, to 
um, uh, you know, fund schools and, and police departments and, and other emergency services. Um, and then finally, it's, it's really about climate change. So it, it provides that grid decarbonization, uh, cleaner air uh, equals healthier communities. Thank you very much. We'll move on to the next. The Birch Solar Project is a 300 megawatt AC solar project located southwest of Lima. It is in Allen and Auglaize County. The Southwest Lima substation is a substation that we'll be feeding the project electrons into. To date, we have approximately 2,600 leased acres, and of that, about 1,900 will be fenced acres, and about 900 will actually have panels on them. Over the last couple of months, we've received many questions about why we have chosen this location for the project. When we're looking to site a solar project, we're looking at four main factors. First and foremost, we need interconnection. This particular project will be feeding into the Southwest Lima substation. That substation gives us access to the greater PJM grid and allows the electrons that we are producing to go far and wide through the electrical system. The second piece we are looking at is the land and the environment. Agricultural land is actually ideal for solar because it is already disrupted land. In addition, we run a number of environmental studies to make sure that we are being good stewards of the land and we are studying everything from soil composition to sp particular species that may be living around the area. We make sure that our site is compatible with solar and making sure that we are not disrupting additional natural resources. In addition, we need demand. Corporate and traditional utilities are the typical offtake for projects such as this. In this particular circumstance, we do have a corporate offtake for this project and this electricity will be going onto the greater grid for that corporate offtake. The fourth feature we look at is community partnership. LightSource BP is committed to community partnership, to giving back to the community, to providing adjacent landowner payments, and to being a good partner within the greater community. This project will be part of our responsible solar commitment. That requires us to integrate the project into the community as much as we can, leaving things like natural tree lines and wetlands alone and making sure that this is part of the community that we have already entered into. The current BIRCH timeline is being driven by permitting and also the completion of environmental and development studies. Our environmental and environmental studies will continue throughout the next couple of months as we firm up our boundary and continue on the detailed engineering that is needed for the project. Our permitting activities have kicked off in our pre-application period. However, we are looking to formally submit our application in December of 2020. The OPSB permitting process will last approximately nine months into 2021, at which point we can then begin construction in late 2021 or early 2022. We are making our way to operations in 2023, approximately Q3 to Q2 of 2023 will be our commercial operations date. The project will then have approximately a 35 year life cycle and at which time will be decommissioned.
The Birch Solar Project truly is an economic investment and the Allen and Glaze County communities. The entire project will invest $337 million in private capital funds into the project area and into the project itself. 4.6 million will be an annual operating budget, which is primarily spent within the region of the project. That goes to operations and maintenance of the facility, which happens 24 hours a day, seven days a week. In addition, there are participating landowner payments providing diversified and really long-term income for farmers. So they're able to keep their homes, they're able to keep their farms, and they're able to keep their property within their family. In addition, we will be providing neighboring landowner payments. These payments will go to adjacent neighbors around the project area, and they will range based on how impacted they are by the project. In addition to that, it is very important that LightSource BP gives back to the community that it is partnering with. We have established a community donation fund of half a million dollars to be spent by the community on community-focused projects. This could be fire equipment, it could be a new playground or park, this is something that we will work with the community on to make sure that the community's needs are met. In addition to economic investment, job creation is also a very large attribute of the project. LightSource BP is committed to over 80% of our construction labor being local. Local employees are often trained in specific solar skills and they can take those skills for the rest of their career and the rest of their life. We take it upon ourselves to make sure that we are employing local, the local community as much as we are able. A project of this size will employ approximately 400 full-time temporary positions. Those positions range from electricians, logistics and transportation, operators, administrative officials, and solar technicians and installers. In addition, according to an OSU study, approximately the same amount of indirect jobs are also created when a project like this is in construction. Those jobs include restaurants, gas stations, hotels, construction rentals, and construction services. Overall, this will be a very busy and wonderful time for the Lima community and for the project areas, bringing economic investment into the local community, schools, counties, and townships. One of the great benefits of hosting a solar project such as the Birch Solar Project is the enormous tax revenue that is acquired by the county, township, and school districts that can go to community services. Solar projects like this raise substantial new tax revenue while also supporting those local needs and not increasing the tax base for local residents. Annual property tax payments in lieu of taxes will equal approximately 2.7 million annually or 81 million throughout the life of a project. These additional funds reduce the need for additional levies for school districts, help to repair buildings, provide new educational material or sports fields, and really help to invest into a community. As you can see, there are, is an approximate breakdown of the property tax payments in lieu of taxes, with 5% going to the vocational schools, 54% going to the school district, 17% to the county, and 24% to the township. These payment in lieu of tax structures provide substantial income throughout the life of the project and also provides sustainable income throughout the life of the project without boom and bust years for the community. It's important that we talk about the community impact and the conversation that needs to be had. We are not here to tell you that this is not a change to the community because it is, but we believe this is a positive change to the community as a whole. While there will be aesthetic changes, BP Lystorts works very hard to make sure that we are including vegetation and shrubs around the perimeter of the project where we are able, to include setbacks from home and other residences, and also to look at fencing options that the community requests or that will make the aesthetics of the project more acceptable. In addition, we are offering adjacent landowner payments of $5,000 to $50,000. This amount will be dependent on the proximity of the landowner and the resident to the project area itself. One of the current studies that we are just completing is the Birch Project Visual Stimulation. As you can see in the two pictures, we are able to take pictures around the project area and then have it look like there are panels there and do visual simulations so that we are able to see what effect the actual panels will have in the aesthetics of the property. In the first picture, you see that area without panels taken approximately two to three weeks ago. 
In the next area, in the next picture, you can see the area where the panels will go just below the tree line and what the setback would look like from the road. The state of Ohio has a state-led permitting process through the Ohio State Siting Board for any project over 50 megawatts. This includes the Birch Solar Project. We will be obtaining a siting permit from the Ohio State Siting Board and studies have been underway since August 2020. The state of Ohio has actually one of the most robust and strict siting standards throughout the Midwest. The process itself will last approximately a year, nine months to a year, with permit applications being submitted in December of 2020. We are currently in what's in the pre-application phase, which includes substantial local community outreach to ensure that the community is informed. In addition, community outreach and participation in the OPSB process is very important to the OPSB. While permitting does go through the state, Birch Solar will utilize best practices to incorporate local zoning into the project design when we are able, and we will be obtaining construction and building permits as required by the county. Birch Solar will continue to work with counties and townships to put in place a road use agreement. Roads will be left in the condition they are in or better due to road enhancements that may be needed for deliveries. The Ohio Power Siting Board has a very thorough and robust regulatory system that we must work through in order to achieve our permit. Feeding into that permit are a number of studies around the project area and of the environment and health and safety around the project that feed into that particular permitting application. As you can see on the slide, there are a number of studies that feed into the application, but I would like to call out a couple, particularly the geotechnical and hydrology studies. We are looking at soil composition and any underground or over or on ground waterways. Additionally, we're composing a decommissioning plan so that we can show the, co the community in detail exactly how we will be removing panels and what we will be doing at the end of life. As part of this decommissioning plan, we do have it in our long term lease agreements that we will be providing security or a bond in order to decommission this particular project. We are also looking at a road use survey, so we're studying the baseline and projected impact of any construction activities and transportation activities. We will be performing a glint and glare study, which will review project reflection and the FAA screening on the project. And then in addition to that, we'll be doing a cultural study to look at any cultural artifacts found or cultural significance in the area. That particular study will, be include, will include guidance from the Ohio State Historical Preservation Office, or SHPO. And last but not least, we will be looking at the wetland and stream delineation survey in order to try to reduce any impact to wetlands or streams, and we are able to map those out in order to construct our layout accurately. Hi, this is Stephen Barnes, the Vice President of Project Management and Construction for LightSource BP Americas. I'm excited to be talking to you today about the Birch Solar Project. Um, and the uh, light source team that is uh, currently working on the uh, planning and uh, uh, engineering and uh, project construction um, for the project. So this is my 10th year in solar. Um, been uh, working on utility scale solar projects um, all across the US from California, North Carolina, Mississippi, Florida, um, Colorado, just to name a few. Uh, put in place just about four gigawatts of solar. Um, also included projects uh, that I worked on in uh, South America and Chile. Um, so very excited about uh, the opportunity uh, for this project. And we have a team of about 15 people here at LightSource BP. Um, and with that team, we have a, fo a strong focus on safety, uh, safety director, we have a quality director, uh, pre-construction manager that uh, focuses in on um, our projects and uh, working with our EPC partners. And we have a uh, group of uh, project managers and construction managers. So talking a little bit about the Birch Solar Project. Uh, the Birch Project is uh, gonna be using array technology, single axis, low profile trackers. Um, this is a single axis tracker and the reason that we've uh, chosen this tracker um, is it is low profile and uh, it uh, has a single axis tracker in the morning it uh, tilts to the east 
um, capturing the morning sun. And as the uh, sun advances through the sky, um, it uh, follows the sun um, at, at noon, midday. Um, the tracker is um, facing at a zero degree tilt. And as the sun begins to move across the sky and set in the west, the uh, trackers follow the uh, sun to the west. Uh, so excited to be doing this project with Array Technologies. Uh, we've worked on, on a number of projects with them. They're a really good partner. Um, as far as solar modules, we're still making final decisions on that. We've got a few different uh, uh, module technologies that we're current, currently installing across our projects. Um, um, the technology we're looking at is a, potentially a Canadian solar module. Um, it's a bifacial module. Um, we've got that deployed um, or actually uh, deploying that at our project in Colorado. Uh, 240 megawatt AC, as well as we've uh, installed that at some of our projects in uh, Pennsylvania. Um, also, another product is the uh, Trina Solar Duomax uh, bifacial module, and we've uh, installed that at our project in Texas. Um, we've got a uh, 198 megawatt AC project. Um, we're also working with another partner for solar on some of our projects in uh, uh, Texas. Um, to install the uh, the uh, first solar uh, modules there. So we have a number of different modules we're considering uh, for the project. Um, as far as the project consists of um, uh, modules uh, on a tracker, a single axis tracker. Um, those have a uh, DC collection system to collect all of the DC wire. Um, and then that's run to uh, inverters uh, on the site, which uh, change the inverter, the uh, a voltage from a DC to a AC and then runs back to the substation. So the collection wiring on the site will be buried underground to a maximum depth of about 42 inches on site. As I said, the the MV collection after it's converted from a DC to AC um, runs back to the substation um, and the project substation. There'll be a single substation on site, APV collector substation, where we collect all of the uh, um, all of the uh, voltage from the site, and that gets in um, connected to the grid and injected to the grid there. So we're partnering uh, with AEP and their Southwest Lima substation um, as an interconnection point. And uh, that's uh, how we connect to the grid. Um, so excited to uh, talk to you about the project and uh, I'll continue on the next slide. Hi, this is uh, Steve Barnes again, uh, VP of Construction for LightSource BP. Um, so what will construction look like for the community? Um, so we work uh, very closely with our engineering team, also our development team, permitting team, um, to really uh, focus on the engineering um, and the optimization of the project. Um, and in doing so, we're really trying to, you know, avoid and reduce the amount of grading on the site um, and uh, really spend a lot of time, um, you know, working to uh, minimize um, any uh, impacts for, um, you know, setbacks or with the neighbors, um, including vegetative screening, um, trying to, to uh, locate the site um, and the project from any sensitive you know, areas or habitat on the site um, and really take that into consideration. Um, try and, and take into account the um, existing uh, land and slope and hydrology on the site to really minimize the uh, impact on the site. Um, and in that, we work with the consultants on the site. We uh, order studies on surveying, uh, topography, geotech, um, on the soils um, and, and look at the drainage and hydrology and also engage with biologists and ecologists to look at the vegetation and uh, really um, look at how to minimize the um, the uh, impact on the project um, during construction and uh, also a uh, long term as far as uh, being able to return the project in the future uh, back to its pre-existing uh, condition and available for, for land um, or agriculture. Um, we also spend a lot of time with our uh, sustainability team um, looking at ways that we can uh, include 
uh, different types of uh, vegetation or pollinators on our projects, as well as providing areas for um, agriculture, um, such as uh, sheep grazing on our projects, which we're very excited about. Um, and like I said, we use extensive engineering and biological studies on um, this to, to minimize the grading and impacts um, and come up with a really uh, light on land approach um, to our projects. Um, and that also helps to minimize um, the, the grading and uh, you know any sort of uh, dust control or issues on the project. So we take all of these items, um, all of these site studies, and we come up with the uh, you know an optimized design for the project. Um, and once we have that, then we uh, package that together and we go out to our EPC partners for the solar plant and the substation construction. And uh, through a competitive bidding process, um, you know, we're working with uh, top solar construction firms um, such as uh, Swinnerton, McCarthy, and Rosenden as some of our partners um, that we're cur currently delivering projects on um, across the country. Um, so the uh, construction schedule for the project is currently scheduled to begin in late 2021 or early 2022. Um, it's about a 16 month a construction project and uh, finishing up in mid-2023. Um, we anticipate about 350 to 400 uh, workers on the project and the majority of those workers would be um, from uh, Ohio area and uh, we always try and concentrate on local workers and also um, work to put in place um, training programs and apprenticeship programs to um, work with the local community and uh, get uh, people um, from the local cities or counties um, interested and excited and uh, um, employed on the projects. Um, so the Birch uh, Solar Project, other key aspects, it will design and implement uh, stormwater pollution prevention plans on the project. Uh, we'll work on um, the site entrances and exits to reduce any any mud or debris on the roads, um, as well as uh, um, having uh, uh, different uh, folks out there that uh, make sure that um, we have uh, safe traffic control programs. We do put in place a, a traffic control plan uh, to eliminate, reduce construction or deliveries from sensitive areas and develop the best uh, route to the projects. Um, as I mentioned before, we, we definitely focus on a light on land approach to minimize the amount of grading. Um, the project will um, utilize uh, comprehensive um, dust control measures during construction to eliminate dust controls um, or any sort of concerns um, during the construction process. Thank you. Um, we take uh, health and safety very uh, seriously. Um, and uh, it's really ingrained in our culture and uh, it's really a focus of everything we do on our projects from engineering to um, you know construction operations and maintenance how we interface with the local communities um, and uh, every every meeting that we have um, starts with a safety moment as well as you know on our construction sites um, we start uh, every day with uh, stretch and flex and really focused on safety plan of the day. Um, so it's it's not just, uh, um, you know, something that we include in our projects. It's really a cultural item that we strive every day to make sure that everybody goes home safely to their families. That's our employees. That's the contractors. It's our it's our the workers on the project. It's the, the local people in the community. Um, we are extremely focused on safety um, every day and everything we do. We have a, a plan of the day meetings. Um, we have toolbox talks on our projects. We focus on safety um, during the electrical phase of the project, during the grading phase, during uh, uh, for dust control, for um, how we get our trucks to the site, um, all of the items. Um, safety is is extremely important to us. So. It's a safe, safe and ethical behavior. Um, it's a component of everything we do. Um, and uh, we uh, focus on our, our contractors and they build it into their design. They have a, a job activities where they plan out every activity for um, safe um, installation and uh, um, safety on all of the activities. 
Uh, any employee at LightSource can stop work for any reason if they feel it's unsafe. Um, and that's either our team or the contractors or even somebody visiting the site. Um, so we, we also have a comprehensive emergency response plan where we coordinate with the local officials, um, paramedics, um, the uh, sheriff's department, um, emergency first responders, uh, the fire department, um, to make sure they know how to get to our site um, and uh, uh, make sure that we uh, keep everybody safe. Um, we also are, in, you know, right now working with the COVID protocols um, and have a, a very uh, comprehensive program on how we um, do construction on our projects and keep everybody safe and really try and reduce uh, and minimize the spread of, of the virus um, uh, on our projects and within the local community. Um, we're building uh, big projects in, in other locations and have a very good track record of uh, very few um, uh, COVID uh, incidents on any of our sites. Um, so like I said, we um, uh, start each day with safety and we end each day with safety and it's ingrained in our culture. And we want to also bring that to this project and uh, make sure that we're a good, good uh, partner for the community and to keep everybody Um, as discussed previously, we really safety and uh, uh, sustainability go hand in hand. Um, so when we're designing our projects, we really take a strong focus on um, the engineering, on the site studies, how can we design sustainability into our projects from uh, light on land approach um, during construction to minimize the grading, um, also to minimize the disruption um, to um, our neighbors or local communities, having comprehensive stormwater um, plans in place, uh, dust control plans, traffic control plans to really minimize the impact uh, to our local um, neighbors and, and local communities to the projects, um, as well as we look at the long-term um, uh, life cycle of the projects. Um, from the solar panels that we select, we we only use top tier module manufacturers that have comprehensive um, documentation on how their panels were manufactured um, and making sure that there's no um, hazardous elements in their, in their modules. Um, also on our projects, we have uh, recycling plans for any modules that are damaged during construction or during operations that 100% of those um, are recycled um, during that process um, to make sure that we're um, being good, good uh, partners for the environment and want to make sure that the uh, panels um, go to our recyclers and do not end up in the landfill. Um, so our projects also, we have during the operations and maintenance phase, we have our projects that are monitored um, 24 hours a day, seven days a week um, from an operations center, um, as well as we will have workers on site um, during the operation phase um, to make sure that everything is operating properly and uh, making sure that uh, the site is um, uh, capturing all of the energy from the site and the trackers are tracking the way they're supposed to. And we uh, also uh, work with our O&M providers um, on the uh, uh, monitoring and the upkeep of the plant on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. 
One other key aspect is that we focus on as we start with the end of the project and, and you know, everything that we do and, and look at that. So decommissioning and recycling. Um, for the de decommissioning of all of our projects, um, we take a look at all of the different elements on the project, the solar modules, the tracker, the um, medium voltage and DC collection system, all of the wiring on the site um, are all um, materials that can be recycled. Um, so we have a, a comprehensive um, decommissioning recycling plan to make sure that uh, at the end of life of the solar plant that the all of those items can be recycled and uh, the land um, can be returned to its uh, pre-existing condition and can be available for um, uh, farming or agricultural and uh, make it uh, uh, return it back to its pre-existing condition. So like I said, we work with partners in the recycling community um, to make sure that our, our modules um, go to the uh, recycling facilities and want to be good corporate citizens and um, uh, support the, uh, the life cycle of our projects. Hi everyone, my name is Alyssa Edwards and I'm Head of Environmental Affairs and Government Relations for LightSource BP. And I'm gonna take a few minutes just to talk about our deep company commitment to delivering low carbon energy in a manner that considers environmental and social sustainability. And these commitments play out for us in real ways. We employ this ethos throughout projects in our US and global portfolio. We know that areas in and around solar facilities can be managed in a way that provides a net benefit to the environment, whether it's the establishment of pollinators, sheep grazing, or other simple initiatives like bat and bird boxes. It's truly our company ethos to add value where we can within the communities we work or the environment. In places where our projects sit on land traditionally used as agriculture, we are particularly mindful of the dual use strategy as it relates to traditional farming. Taking farmland out of production and implementing initiatives such as pollinator establishment, beekeeping, or sheep grazing provides nourishment for the soil making it more valuable for future traditional agricultural uses. On this slide, I'd like to highlight sustainable benefits beyond clean, affordable electricity. And I'll just chat here about four different categories of benefits. The first is land regeneration. A solar farm is relatively undisturbed for decades once constructed. The land underneath the solar panels are essentially untouched. Because we will be planting habitat that provides biodiversity value, particularly to pollinators, we can provide a haven for species rich grass, herbs, wildflowers, and other types of local wildlife. Solar gives land a recovery period and it increases future soil quality and land value. The second benefit, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about this in subsequent slides, is co-located agriculture, otherwise known as agrovoltaics. At Birch Solar, we have a plan to implement sheep grazing, which keeps the land in agriculture production and provides farmers with additional revenue. Grazing also provides low impact vegetation management and also promotes soil health. The third category is rural resilience. And solar helps mitigate carbon emissions from energy generation and its effect on the land, wildlife, and people. But also it provides diversified revenue stream for landowners and their families for 25, 30, or more years. And lastly, I'd like to discuss increased biodiversity and pollinator-friendly solar, something we will also talk about in the coming slides. Native pollinator friendly seeding does help conserve declining pollinator habitat and it provides a healthy food source for beneficial insects. Fostering pollinator habitats can also help boost nearby crop yields. On this slide, I'd like to talk about our environmental stewardship, starting with environmental best practices. LightSource BP implements best practices for all projects in our portfolio. And I'm just gonna mention a few here that we have employed for the Birch project. 
We are conducting a full suite of site-specific environmental surveys along with state and federal wildlife regulatory agency consultation. This helps us understand what natural resources may be present at the site, and through consultation with regulators, we get the right information so that we can be sure to avoid these resources. The project footprint is on land that has been previously disturbed through agriculture and other activities. This is on purpose and by design. It's one of the most effective ways to avoid and conserve habitat. By employing setbacks from wetlands and other features, we do design project infrastructure away from important habitat areas. So this is a really important avoidance best practice. And finally, no trees will be removed at the project site. We keep the trees to integrate with the project and its surroundings. It provides natural screens, and of course it maintains existing bird and bat habitats. Now I'd like to just quickly switch to solar panel safety. Solar panels at our farms during normal operations, as well as in the event a solar panel is damaged, will not leach toxic chemicals into the environment. There's a strong lamination process used during the manufacturing of solar PV panels, and this would capture any potentially hazardous material within the laminated glass assembly. It basically prevents exposure to the environment. In addition, there's a test called the Toxicity Characteristic Leasing Procedure, or TCLP. And it's used to determine if, in the event of breakage of a solar panel, any contaminants could potentially leak into the environment at toxic levels. And these are governed by strict limits established by the US EPA under the US Federal Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, otherwise known as RECRA. So you can be rest assured that our solar panels are safe. We require all of our suppliers to pass the TCLP test before we place a solar panel at our project sites. And lastly, I'd like to just touch on recycling and decommissioning. LightSource BP is committed to managing our solar farms throughout their entire life cycle. And that really puts us in a unique position. And this entire life cycle includes end of life management of solar equipment. We're committed to promoting a circular economy and we work with industry organizations to optimize the recovery of materials in a solar panel when they do reach their end of life. At the end of the project, the installation will be dismantled, removed and recycling without harming the land. And we make sure that the land is restored to its original state or even better, and can return to agricultural activities. And one last thing I'll just mention about this is that LightSource BP is a board member of the Solar Energy Industries Association, otherwise known as SIA. And this is an organization whose members are dedicated to responsible end of life management. And we are proactively developing collection and recycling processes for the solar industry as a whole. And SIA has actually created a national PV recycling member-based program that aggregates the services offered by recycling vendors and PV manufacturers, making it easier to select a cost-effective and environmentally responsible end-of-life management solution. We encourage you to continue to visit our website and also follow along with the permitting activities. For more information, please go to lightsourcebp.com backslash birch. In addition, you can stay connected to us at Birch Solar at LightSourceBP.com. The Ohio Power Siding Board is the state of Ohio agency responsible for the review of this project. The board is comprised of the directors of six different state agencies, as well as a professional engineer who is appointed by the governor. The six board agencies are the Public Utilities Commission of Ohio, the Ohio EPA, the Ohio Department of Agriculture, the Ohio Development Services Agency, the Ohio Department of Natural Resources, and the Ohio Department of Health. In addition to the seven voting board members, the board is served by four advisory non-voting members who come to us from the Ohio legislature, two from the Ohio Senate, and two from the Ohio House of Representatives. 
The board relies on a technical staff comprised of staff members from the six board agencies, as well as coordinating agencies, including the Ohio Department of Transportation, the Ohio Historic Preservation Office, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Before any company can build a major utility facility in the state of Ohio, the OPSB assures that it benefits Ohio citizens, promotes the state's economic interests, and protects the environment and land use. Public and local government participation are strongly encouraged in the board's process, but the decision-making authority does rest solely with the Power Siding Board. If a project is approved, the OPSB issues a certificate for the construction, operation, and maintenance of the facility. The OPSB's jurisdiction is not limited to solar farms. Our solar farm jurisdiction begins at 50 megawatts, but we also have jurisdiction over wind farms at 5 megawatts and greater and fossil fuel plants at 50 megawatts and greater. In addition to electric generation projects, we have jurisdiction over certain types of electric transmission lines and natural gas transmission pipelines. This flow chart describes the OPSB review process from beginning to end. The review process generally takes nine to 12 months and begins with the applicant informational meeting. After the informational meetings, the applicant has up to 90 days to submit its application to the board. Once that application is received, the board will take up to 60 days to review it and ensure that it contains all the relevant information and studies required under the rules. Once the application is deemed complete, the OPSB staff will begin its investigation, reviewing the materials and conducting site visits to ground truth the information contained in the application. The board staff will coordinate with member agencies and other state and federal agencies in the review of that application before issuing a report that makes recommendations to the board members. The board will hold a public hearing and later an adjudicatory hearing to gather input from landowners, members of the community, and other stakeholders. The board will make a decision at one of its monthly board meetings whether or not to grant or deny a certificate. Once a certificate is issued or denied, parties will have up to 30 days to apply for the board to reconsider or rehear all or parts of its decision. If a party is still dissatisfied, they may appeal that decision to the Supreme Court of Ohio. Now I'd like to take a moment to go over some of the ways that you can participate in the board's process. The public informational meeting is the developer's opportunity to educate the community about the project and gather input to consider in developing its application. It's your opportunity to provide feedback about the project and ask questions. OPSB representatives provide information about the siting process and the ways you can get involved. At any point during the proceeding, you may file public comments. Those written comments are filed in the case record where they inform the board staff and the board members. Comments are accepted at any time after a case number is established. And we have already begun to receive a number of comments in this case. We understand that the public has concerns and will consider to review those comments going forward. You can submit comments online at opsb.ohio.gov by email at contactopsb at puco.ohio.gov or by mail at the address on your screen. At the local public hearing, the board will obtain sworn statements from members of the public that are transcribed and become part of the official record that the board considers before making its decision. At the adjudicatory hearing, the developer, the OPSB staff, and any formal parties to the case will present testimony and evidence regarding the facility and cross-examine each other. Intervention grants individuals and local governments the right to participate as a party in the adjudicatory hearing 
file for rehearing of a board decision or appeal a decision to the Supreme Court of Ohio. If you have questions about intervention, there is information on our website regarding the steps to take to request intervention and will be available at the public informational meeting to answer any questions that you might have. If a project is approved by the board, the OPSB monitors construction and operation to ensure that the applicant is complying with the certificate and any terms and conditions of that certificate. The developer must notify landowners prior to the start of construction and must establish a complaint resolution process to address concerns resulting during construction and operation. The OPSB can assist individuals who feel they are not obtaining a resolution from the developer. The board's website, opsb.ohio.gov, contains a wealth of information about the case and the board process. You can also follow along with our calendar of events to learn about upcoming hearing dates and access our Facebook page where you can follow and receive updates about the project. Our docketing information system at dis.puc.state .oh.us is a subset of our website that we use to store all case documents and public comments. The case number for this project is 20-1605 ELBGN. You can use that case number when you file comments in the case or to subscribe for case notifications and receive an email each time a new document is added to the case record. There are several ways that you can stay in touch with the board. You can reach us by email at contactopsb at puco.ohio.gov. You can call us at 866-270-6772, or you can reach us at the mailing address shown on your screen. We'll be available at the public informational meetings on November 20th and 23rd, and look forward to having a conversation and answering any questions that you might have at that time.